Um, Mr. Adam, if you'd like to take it away and give, give us a summary of um, OTEC, that would be greatly appreciated to wind down the show. Thanks a lot, Eden, and, and thanks to everyone for sticking with it all the way to this part of the, the afternoon. It's been a lot to digest, a lot to take in, and lots of questions. I've got several questions of my own. But just to very quickly introduce the concept of OTEC to understand why I'm so excited about it. And I think the, the Cayman Islands and many other islands are ideal venues for it. Uh, basically, what, what OTEC is, is if you consider the ocean is the largest solar collector in the world. And what ocean thermal energy is, is a way of utilizing all of that solar energy, which is stored in the area near the surface of the sea that is thermal energy, it's warm, particularly in the tropical regions of the world. And from that derive an endless source of energy because this type of energy conversion will work no matter whether the sun is shining or it's an overcast day. It will work whether the wind is blowing or it's calm. And it will also work during a hurricane. So, what we, what we have with ODEC is something that is most pertinent where the difference between the sea surface temperature and the temperature deep down in the ocean, which is as those of us that are physicists or, or um, other people who are involved in, in ocean, ocean technology will know that the, the water as you get deeper and deeper in the ocean gets colder and colder until you reach a point where it gets down near four degrees centigrade. Doesn't get any colder there, it's, it's, I won't go into the detail of that. It has to do with how the hydrogen one works, but it doesn't get colder than that. But if you look at the difference in temperature between that cold, deep water and the water at the surface of the sea and the tropics, there's a, there's, a, there's a difference in temperature there that can be utilized in a cycle known as a Rankine cycle. It's a very commonly used cycle in many types of power generation that Basically, those that, most of those that use turbines are using that cycle. So the benefit of this is this is utilizing known methods, known thermodynamic cycles in a new way to use the ocean to be the source of heat in a boiler. And that boiler is very, this is a very familiar um, schematic diagram for anybody who's been involved in, in generating uh, electricity from a turbine whether you're a nuclear plant, a coal-fired plant, uh, and, and even some of the um, LNG plants and so on. This is the same cycle they use. The difference here is that the heat to the boiler is the warm water at the top of the ocean. So you use a working fluid that will boil at a temperature that's a bit below what the sea surface temperature is at. That converts that working fluid into a gas that gas creates a head of pressure flowing past the turbine to the other side where you condense it back down and then you feed that back, that liquid back into the boiler. So closed cycle for OTEC, you want to use really an, an organic compound. You don't want to use water as is used in most ranking cycles, but the same, the same thing works, okay? You, you know, you're boiling a working fluid to create a gas. The gas spins a turbine, the turbine spins a generator. The other side of the turbine condenses back down using something cold to get it back into a liquid, that same gas. That's a cycle. Now, um, I won't go into every detail except to say that you'll see up here, there's a, there's a logo there of a company called Sea Solar Power. I came across Sea Solar Power through, uh, through a, a contact that they'd had with my brother, who, as you know, is very interested in, in lots of different things. And he, referred me to it and said, you know, Tim, take a look at it. What do you think? And the more I looked at this, the more sense it makes and what it uses and what is proposed for this type of OTEC plant that is being proposed by this company who has developed this type of technology for it is a floating plant. So a plant that would be out in the sea over the deep ocean where you have water that's a kilometer or so deep, you know, about 3,000 foot, three, three and a half thousand foot water, because that's where the cold water comes from. 
what what this this uses a technology that's already used. These are oil rigs. There are floating oil rigs. This technology is well known how to do it to build these rigs. Um, in wind plant, you're familiar with with these uh, mid ocean um, wind turbines. Well, many of them now are floating. So the floating technology for 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 power plant that are renewables is is nothing new. The floating technology for oil um, extraction is nothing new. And as a matter of fact, the, the, the cycle that I'm talking about itself is nothing new. It's just that all of those things have not yet been put together to generate utility scale uh, electricity. However, OTEC is by no means an unproven technology. I mean, the first discussions on OTEC were back in the, the late um, 1800s. And there's an article written back sometime, I think it was in the late 1960s, that where in one of the, the journals on these things, where OTEC was researched in fairly good detail as to how to do it. It has been actually built as a demonstration plant and has been working since 2015 in Hawaii, in the Big Island, just south of the airport. And that plant has been working, as I said, since 2015. It was a small plant, just a bit over 100 kilowatts. In other words, lighting up just a few homes, maybe up to 100 homes or something like that at, at any one point in time. Fairly small plant, but it's a plant that demonstrated not only does all of this theory work, but actually it can be brought together. It can be working very reliably and it works 24 7, 365. So if you're, when we're talking to anyone about renewables, we're, talk, we're talking about um, how, how on earth are we gonna transition away from oil to, uh, or hydrocarbon to OTEC, here are just some of the advantages of it. It's, it's the only renewable source I know of that could be pertinent to use in Cayman today if we could build it that fast, that will generate baseload electrical power. We know a lot about solar photovoltaic cells. You know, the photovoltaics are the, the solar cells that are used in solar farms, they're used in rooftop solar installations. That technology is well known, it gets a lot of press, but it's intermittent. When the sun goes down, it's not generating anything. Wind is well known, but wind is intermittent. When the wind stops, it's not generating anything. Sure, you can install batteries to try and smooth that out, but it, ultimately you end up where for a utility to be responsible, they have to know that they have a constant source of what is called base load power. That amount of power that you always have to have. And then you can have other arrangements to take care of peak power and, and to manage the peak power. That's where batteries could come in and other forms of storage of intermittent power can come in to fill, the, to fill that gap by renewables. But I'm, I'm not familiar unless you, you know Eden and, and any of the other people on the, on the video conference of any other source of truly renewable, truly green, truly sustainable base load power generation. That's what OTEC is. Um, the, the, the other thing that, that you find with OTEC is that in generating this power, it has no carbon emissions. It's just using the heat of the ocean. You know, it's, it's not, not like, for example, LNG. LNG is a lot better than using diesel or using coal in terms of emissions but there are still some emissions. This is truly green and it's truly renewable because the sun is constantly pumping heat into the surface temperature, into the surface layers of the ocean, particularly in the tropics where the angle of the sun is, is coming down fairly sharp, right? It's coming down uh, and if, it, if it's cloudy today, the sea surface temperature doesn't change today. Very, very little variation in sea surface temperature, even between winter and summer. Um, the, the other thing that, that OTEC does, it has a lot of, of side benefits. Because you're bringing up cold water from the deep ocean, that water is rich in nutrients. So where that water escapes out into the ocean, because the plant, you see, is, is submerged, the, the top 
the top surface that, that you'll have, um, the top of the plant surface is only to get people and equipment off and on, but the working part of the plant is actually below sea level, right? Below the sea surface, you know? And the water is coming up, passing through this plant, the cold water, and then being passed out at a low level, maybe, maybe at around 100 feet. So you also are gonna have an amazing fishery around that because the same way a fishing bank works, right? Where the, the nutrient rich deep ocean water is pushed up to create great fishing, guess what? This is doing exactly the same thing. Estimates are that in some places, the impact of increasing the fisheries and the richness of, of the fisheries, the amount of fish it can support and sustain might end up being economically even more valuable than electricity this thing produces. That's how much of an impact that has. But let's get back to electricity generation. This is a clean, green, total renewable way to generate base load power. And every utility that is providing power has to have some method of providing the base load power. Now, why hasn't it been done before? To, to bring a no tech plant into reality for utility scale, and not just for demonstration, like it's been done in Hawaii, like it's been done in India, for the demonstration plants as well. It takes a lot of investment because the way the numbers work on this, the way the financials work on this, you have to build something, really anything less than about 10, 20 megawatts, about 20 megawatts of generating capacity. You don't gain anything by making it smaller. You don't save a whole lot. You save a little bit, but not a lot. So 20 megawatts based on what? We have researched costings that, that, that the people I've worked with See, Solar Power has been kind enough to put together some slides and a lot of material. And you can look it up, you can look up Sea Solar Power online, seasolarpower.com, S E A S O L A R P O W E R dot C O M. And there you will get a much more detailed description of how this technology works and why the method that that particular company has developed of developing it as a floating plant rather than a shore based plant. Um, makes it that much more efficient, makes it financially feasible. What we're talking about here is not anything airy-fairy, it's not vaporware, it's using known technologies, known um, thermodynamic cycles, and known methods of mounting things that don't take any land. They don't take away from agricultural land that could be productive, either agriculturally or for tourism. They don't take any of that away because this generating plants sits out in the ocean. Using well-known technology, then it brings the power ashore on cables like it's being done. If you go offshore, um, Scotland, for example, or offshore Europe in the, in the English Channel and in the North Sea, you'll see a lot of these wind farms that are out in the ocean and dozens and dozens and dozens of these things. So these technologies of, of mounting power plant in, in floating and partially submerged structures of bringing the power ashore and cables under the ocean of, of the, and as I mentioned, the Rankin cycle of, of boiling a working fluid to create a gas to drive a turbine. All OTEC is doing is putting all that together. These things are well known. But there's one other very, very important issue that has to do with sustainability. What do you do with the plant when it reaches end of life in say 25, 30 years? Or, or even 20, let's say you amortize it over only 20 years. What happens with it? I don't know if you've, if you've seen the challenge that is, is being faced now with disposing of spent solar cells when they reach end of life. Because you know there's a lot of rare earth metals in there and all those sorts of things. Or if you've seen the challenge that's being caused by attempts to dispose of the blades of wind turbines which is a lot of fiberglass and some of the materials used in the fiberglass, big challenges when they come to end of life. When this plant comes to end of life, what, you're, what you have is steel, copper, aluminum, those types of metals that we're already familiar with, metals that can in turn be recycled into new plant, into new purposes, into new equipment, new technologies. So this, this technology answers a lot of needs for any country that has warm sea surface temperatures. In other words, you're in the tropics basically, anywhere between 
zero and 20 degrees north or so. And you have the sea right there and you have deep enough water. So we'd love to continue the discussion at some point about the exciting prospects for it. I'm, I'm myself, I don't know if you know this, but first one to three years of my working career, I was an engineer and I remained active in that field. I'm still an active fellow of the Institu Institution of Engineering Technology. And because of that, this has intrigued me for a number of years and I've gotten more and more involved in it. And a group of us are in discussion with a group of islands presently um, over in Eastern Caribbean talking about this technology to, to implement it. But because of the scale of investment needed, it's going to need some type of funding that is going to be backed by government. It is that scale of investment, particularly for the first plant. Once you roll out the first one and the first utility scale, OTEC has been put in place, a number of things are gonna happen. One is that a lot of the, of the work that has, that has to go into designing that first plant can be replicated. So you save on that and you learn a few things along the way, how to make it a little bit more efficient, how to make it a little more streamlined. And, and that first plant, once you get over that hurdle, the way that we have designed it, with the way that we have scoped this out, this will have financial sustainability. But you gotta get the first one built. And for that, we'll take some, a, a bit of, uh, of grant money would be very helpful, but some, some soft loans at low percentage rates then would make this whole thing feasible. That's what this needs. What are you looking at to generate approximately to generate uh, 20 megawatts? I'm looking on the on the Sea Solar Power website here, and they have a table that talks about um, the potential products and the sample prices from a 100 megawatt floating plant. Um, do you yeah, have, wanna... have an idea of a cost of, to do something at 20 megawatts? Well, if you Look, I, I, as you know, after 23 years as in engineering, uh, particularly focused on telecom at the time, but I had a lot to do with power as well there in, in that time of my career. I have spent another 12 years in the private sector as a CEO, running a, a company in the private sector that is in a very competitive industry, and we had to make a profit. And then, then for another 12 years, I ran a, a, a public entity, a government company, that was very heavily involved in conservation and sustainability. So sustainability is very dear to my heart because mm -hmm. from, the time, from the time you start as an engineer, you have that in the back of your mind. From the time you become a CEO, sustainability is a big deal. And when you get into conservation and you put it all together, we, we certainly need to, to, to put together with the, the SDGs, the Sustainable De Development Goals, with, with all the ESG factors, but a very, very important sustainable factor is who's gonna pay for it? Right. How's it gonna get paid for, right? So to cut a long story short, with the plant, a hundred megawatt plant is more um, economically efficient than a 20 megawatt plant. Right. Right? And so the price per kilowatt hour, you know, you amortize it over the, the working life of the, of the of, plant. Of the system, yeah. And, and a conservative estimate of that is about 20 years, okay? So, but I, I can tell you that a 20 megawatt plant over its, its, its 20 year life would be producing electricity at about 11 cents per kilowatt hour. That is a production of electricity, okay? And that's getting it ashore. And that, that costing was looking at somewhere 14, 15 miles of, of underwater cable. And again, we've been very conservative and, and uh, we're not trying to under, under estimate the cost of doing these things. It's not cheap, right? But it's very doable. And it's mm -hmm. actually quite competitive. It's quite competitive. And the, with, the, with the other products to offset it, that I mean, that makes it a yeah. very good business case for, for yeah. investing yes. in it. Yes, I mean, in one, one of my dreams is eventually um, build an OTEC plant that a significant portion of the OTEC plant will be feeding an electrolyzer, creating hydrogen. Right. Because I don't know, I don't know if you know this, but but one of my passions in life is aviation. And you know, I'm still a licensed private pilot <laughs> and working on that on, on opportunities for having 
airplanes here available and instructors here available. And that's a whole other talk we could have. But even in the aviation industry, even for the airliners, large aircraft, there are determined efforts to convert those to hydrogen. Mm -hmm. If you can do that for an airplane, bearing in mind the, the challenges of, of using hydrogen as a fuel, then doing it for a truck is really not as big a problem as it might seem. As a matter of fact, there are trucks now, there are, are trucks now in Europe that you can find running on hydrogen. There are backhoes in England running on hydrogen. There are cars that are being developed to run on hydrogen. Denmark just I, um, just try, did a, a hydrogen powered cargo uh, vessel as a trial. Ships, exactly. 2021. To run on hydrogen. So imagine now if you could generate really green hydrogen because a fair amount of the hydrogen produced today is what's called blue hydrogen. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a lot cleaner. This production is a lot cleaner, but it, the production isn't totally green. Production off an OTEC plant because the source of your energy has no carbon emission. It's totally green. And, and so my dream would be that, that you know, a significant portion of the OTEC output would be into, um, into a, an electrolyzer to produce hydrogen. And then I, I don't know if you followed it much, but hydrogen then can be stored. You know, we're very familiar, of course, with you take the hydrogen and you cool it and cryogenic cooling, you compress it and you ship it as hydrogen. But actually there are, are now, there have now been developed much more efficient, much more energy dense ways of, of storing, transporting, and uh, plugging hydrogen into a vehicle um, than, than just as a gas. Um, there, there's a lot of research being done. For example, in the hydrides, uh, where you, you have a metal, and, and it's interesting how, how much energy you can store in hydrogen when you involve a metal as part of the storage medium rather than purely as a tank full of gas. But they, I'm, I'm digressing. I'm just saying that is just one example of what a nation that has a good supply of the energy, i.e. warm sea surface temperatures, which goodness knows we have a lot of it, and, and has cold water nearby, in other words, deep ocean, three, three and a half thousand foot, foot deep. Um, and you could, you could position these plants to where they're producing not only electricity, but you can produce hydrogen, but also you can produce fresh water. And you probably heard the mantra that, that uh, water is going to be the new oil, you know, the need for drinking water. Right. That, is, that, is, that is fresh and is clean. So I, I like to say, I, if this is very exciting. It probably deserves a whole other session and it probably deserves that we involve the experts, the gentlemen I've been talking with in Sea Solar Power. I want to give them full credit and I've borrowed a whole lot. I've borrowed shamelessly from their slides to create this slide deck today. So I, I'll have to ask forgiveness if they think I share too much <laughs> rather than permission. But no, they've, they've been... Um, admirable people to work with. And it's been excellent to see how this journey has now really begun to pick up some momentum. Um, as I say, it's, it looks like where we have focused our energy right now for a number of reasons is in the Eastern Caribbean, but this technology could absolutely work in Cayman. Absolutely could work in Cayman. And, um, and the, 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 the sizing we've done is because that pertains to the sizing needed in, in the venue we're looking at, right? The 20 megawatts. Right. For the cluster of islands we're looking at, at doing this in. I can't say too much more about that at the moment, but very excited about the prospects. Excellent. I mean, that's a that's a reasonable size to look at um, for Cayman as well. And I'm on the Energy Policy Council and um, OTEC has been, you know, kicked around uh, as, as part of the uh, national energy policy but um, what, the talk within the council, uh, to make a long story short, is too expensive. We, we, we can't uh, really integrate that yet. The, um, these numbers and the beneficial byproducts that are coming off it as far as creating other offsets for the economic investment really make an argument, uh, a different size of uh, style argument for um, bringing this to the council in a new light. So um, any type of meeting like this that happens virtually or that I'm, I'm taking part on, I really like to take away some kind of action 
to pursue. And that is what I would like to do is um, I'd like to chat with you and get some numbers around how this could work sure. and bring a little more realistic picture of how this can be integrated into our plan for in the national energy policy as, as I help to review that. My role on the Energy Policy Council is as a community advocate to make sure that, um, again, that outlying ideas, people who may not have direct uh, contact in, in contribution into it or other technologies or other projects or other initiatives that aren't getting directly looked at um, and the concerns of communities are there at the table as we review the national energy policy. Sure. And I think that this is something that I might be able to help um, action for you. So well, let's-, I, uh, let's... I'd, welcome, I'd welcome that interaction. Um, when you are looking to be the first site of full implementation of something at utility scale, it's not for the faint hearted. Right. And when you're looking to be the developer of the first such plan, you quickly realize this has to be a collaborative effort. Absolutely. The, the ability to, to source and produce and manufacture and integrate the, the plant, the OTEC plant itself, right? The generating plant itself, plus the, the, the housing for it. That is something akin to the housing of, a, of an oil rig, except it sits lower in the water. Uh, I mean, this thing sits so low that basically hurricane isn't a problem. It's not manned. You know, you don't have people on board except for the maintenance routines and so on. Um, so the, the, you, you design it so the waves wash right over it. It's, you know, that, but to do that, you're gonna have to have a marine engineering firm. You're gonna have to have basically a specialized shipyard to build that. You're gonna have to have a, a good source of producing the power cable and the technology of laying that cable and bringing it ashore. These are all technologies that exist. Nothing I'm saying, it, it needs to scare anyone about it being, as I say, vaporware. This is not pie in the sky. Right. And, and this, is, these are, this is just bringing together known technologies, but it's a big investment, right? And, it's, and everybody asks that same question. Okay, so where is this working at utility scale? Nowhere. Well, guess what? You've seen the Artemis or Artemis. That's an amazing bold project. That is using a lot of very leading edge um, components, a lot of leading edge technologies all brought together to make it work. Very high risk. And yet it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. But why? Because you have a, the power of government behind it. Okay, this is going to be an investment of a scale that particularly for the first one or two of these, you're going to have to have the power of either a government or a group of governments that come behind it to find the way, to find the sources of funding that are favorable interest rates. But it's not impossible. It's not for the faint-hearted, but we need to do this. Okay, and the Caribbean is, is ripe for these solutions, not just in Cayman, but elsewhere. As I, as I mentioned, we were in, in some pretty good discussions of you know, in another venue. There's no reason why this couldn't work in Cayman as well. Absolutely. The overseas territory, my other vision is overseas territories, as you know, provide a substantial percentage of the United Kingdom's commitment to biodiversity. Why can't we provide a considerable percentage to the UK's commitments to COP26 for clean power generation. Why not? Why not participate in the new hydrogen economy? Why not have the overseas territories do that? You know, the United Kingdom has massive potential because they have lots of overseas territories. They're not huge, but when you look at their economic zones, you look at their waters, the warm water that they have, the deep water they have offshore, many of them, there's massive potential. But somebody's got to catch this vision. And as I say, we've, we've, I believe we've found a, a cluster of islands, different, different islands, different governments that sound like they might, be, uh, they might be catching this vision. And certainly utility operators there are excited about the prospect. Not for the faint hearted, but we've been, we've been through those sorts of things before. 
Absolutely. Right, Eden, and I really appreciate the opportunity. So let's connect uh, and move it forward. Definitely. I'm so glad that you were able to share this. Uh, I, I definitely really need to see this. And like I say, I think that there's some action to be done here. We're, we'll, um, yeah. we'll, we'll connect after. And thank you for sharing this so much. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much for sharing this information with us, uh, uh, Mr. Tim. Well, thanks for everyone who, who, who held on this long. My goodness. <laughs> More than we bargained for, but we really did get a good bargain. <laughs> Definitely. Day. Thank you very much. And, and to all that came on connection, Rita and um, Ms. Ms. Kanday, I think. Uh, is it Julie? What? Is it, it Julie Kanday? Who's that? Kate. Kate. Sorry. I'm thinking Kate. Wrong. <laughs> Julie is my mother. Julie is yeah, my mother. Yeah, that's right. Right. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Timothy. Yeah, Thank oh you. My. I, you know, I end up being called all kinds of things. I get called by my dad's name, Tommy. <laughs> I very often get called Billy. I very often get called Mike. And when I'm mischievous, I go on as if I'm one of them. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very so, much. Thank so you. I'm so sorry, Julia. I'm sorry. About, I mean, <laughs> Kate, I'm sorry about doing that to you. That's a compliment. But, uh, that's a compliment but, to be called my mother. And that's no problem. <laughs> let me tell you. Yeah, you that fine lady. And, uh, and you know, as you know, a friend of the family for I don't know how many years. Long, long time. Shouldn't even try and say how many because it's been a long time for us. Yeah, yeah <laughs> and, thank uh, you. No, I just want to say thank you all for organizing this and, and putting all this together and shepherding us through it and, you know, keeping it going despite all the things that we wanted to cover today. We, we got to touch on some of the important things. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you so yeah. much. Thank you. just want to say thank you also to Eden, who has <clears throat> spent the four plus hours here with us. A bit unexpected, but certainly worthwhile to see so many people um, stay on, really speaks volumes. Of, and, I'm, and people who left apologized, they wanted to, to stay on, real and truly. And um, we appreciate that. We are happy to serve as a hub of sorts. And um, we're happy to have people in the yard to discuss things that are close to their heart and that impact us all, no matter where we live in the world. And so this has been a really um, wonderful, enlightening, informative meeting. And um, people really took the time. We appreciate the time people put into their presentations, which is why we didn't want to, to cut it short. Um, we, all, we all want the same things. I, I, we see that in the end. And I think it's a matter of us, um, Emily was kind of alluding to it in the end where we have, to, we have to find a way to come together and put aside some of the differences that maybe we've had over the years and, um, and just find a way to make things work because we can do it and we're a small community. So Katie has put um, information there in the chat. Of course, if you had questions, you didn't get a chance to answer those, to get your questions answered, you can email us at Cayman Connection, either kate at caymanconnection.org or rita at caymanconnection.org. And certainly follow all of the entities on social media also, because then you can stay abreast of what's happening with each of the individual organizations. And you can volunteer, take part, ask questions, um, really get involved we hope that when you walk away from the meeting that even if it's just one organization that spoke to, to you, that you follow them and you get involved because every one of us, as, as we were saying earlier in the chat, you know, many hands make light work. So if we're all chipping in together, we really can make such a difference. We already see it happening with even just the beach cleanups. I mean, that's a testament to, to what can happen when a bunch of people decide to get together and, and make a change for the better, right? So once again, I want to thank Eden so much. Really appreciate all the knowledge um, you bring to the yard. And also the fact that you are so involved in so many different ways, not only at home with permaculture, but also in our community on various boards. boards and as, you know, as someone who speaks up, um, you definitely are um, someone we look up to here at Cayman Connection. So we appreciate you coming and spending <laughs> time with us and taking care of our guests too, fielding questions, etc. To each one of the guests who came out, thank you so very much. I know some had to leave. We, um, Kate has, uh, Kate and I have been, you know, communicating also, and the plan is that we will break the meeting up the recordings up. And so we will be sharing out the individual presentations as like a video series. 
um, so that people can, can get those. And each of you then can reshare those so that we can spread the word far and wide about what is being done, what still needs to be done. And then Eden, you were saying, you know, you want to have a takeaway, you want to do something. I know you're going to meet with individuals um, that have been speaking on this call, and some of them you interact with regularly anyway. But I do believe that for four and four hours, 18 minutes here now, is there is there any possibility that something can be organized on the ground in Cayman? We also have we have Cayman Islands representatives. Our board is in Cayman, um, you know, Miss Jennifer Dilbert, and we have others there that I am sure, and Kate can, you know, speak more to this, but is there any way to get us in a physical room and kind of set some parameters and goals? Or maybe this is happening, Eden? You want to speak? It's, it's actually one of the goals of um, Amplify Cayman. What we've been um, trying to, uh, what we've been kicking around is this idea of kind of a um, advocates or NGO um, a circling around, like, a, you know, a, and taking a place Outdoors would be nice, but then the weather unpredictability and things like that. So we're actually looking at a meeting hall type of scenario or something, and then having some different speakers throughout an afternoon um, and different tables with booths where people can interact with some different things that are going on. Um, advocates and people with different initiatives and different projects can talk to each other and be like, oh, hey, that person's doing this. I could help them out with that. Or, hey, I, that person doesn't have a social media presence, but they have a really good thing going. I can help them out with a social media presence or something like that, right? To where you can kind of get all of these ideas in the same room, invite the policymakers, invite the public, and really um, kind of uh, take Amplify's idea of every of making the entire community a think tank and, and uh, solutions-oriented um, engine, so to speak, and, and put that into reality. So that could be something that we can, uh, with Cayman Connection, that could, that could become a reality. Um, yeah. And so uh, the, the, uh, I, I think the, phys the thought of a physical um, meeting that is happening like this, that takes into consideration these kind, of, uh, these kind of concerns, these kind of ideas, these kind of initiatives and these kind of solutions, um, yeah, it, that it, it definitely needs to happen, and so it's something that we've been we've been discussing exactly how do we make this happen? Who are the partners we need? How do we make it not be political? All of that type of uh, of thing, um, and I think that this could be this could be really be a way to make it work. So let's let's discuss that because um, that is definitely something that that needs to happen. Fantastic. I think bringing your challenges to the room, you might find out the solution already exists, or right. it just is a matter of this one doing, you know, like actually saying, well, if we did this here and did that there, that would resolve this. And then I know there's some, it's an interesting way we did this talk, because in the very end, you know, what um, Mr. Tim was talking about is like this umbrella that feeds down into, and, and interestingly enough, Rob as well, um, from Beach Collective, it's so there's, you know, there's the kind of smaller individual action, and then there's the larger scale action, but right. I'm sure there would be a creative way of looking at something really large and totally doable, right? We have, we went to the moon, right? We just went down in the trench, right? I mean, it is, I mean, we can do these things, but it does take effort, change money, all that, but what the good, what's the good of having money? if you can't do something good with it, right? So Absolutely. we can, we, we would love to continue this. So much to say, so much passion, so much interest, so much necessity more than anything. Definitely. Um, and the time is now, the future is now. So thank you all once again. Um, I'm, I'm gonna just let Kate say a, a goodbye to everyone. Thanks everyone, that was amazing. That was epic. That's bigger than we've ever done. Um, you know, we usually, you know, try and keep it, short and sharp and we all agreed actually there's so much good stuff here and when we know we're recording and we know we can separate that out and there can be further leverage on these topics and conversations just by recording this um we felt it was uh, it was important to carry on so thank you so much eden amazing rita thank you so much for pulling this all together you've done a great job in uh, in getting everyone together and and, and introducing people at, at at short notice as well and and factoring everything in so thank you to all our speakers and and everybody for, for joining in really appreciate that and stay connected to Cayman Connection. Thank you all.